miss you guys. Okay, this is, well, we still have over a quarter left. This is the lecture uh, abbreviated for European history for Friday, the 18th of March, 2022. We have just uh, corrected the um, uh, unit exam three, and at the last moment, I realized I hadn't printed your unit, your, your unit four notes. So literally at the last moment, as the tests were being corrected, the copier was working, and there was some kind of delay, which kept me. But in any case, here we are. Now, this unit covers the contemporary world, which begins with World War I. Our future historians might end the, uh, the, the unit um, on 9-11, or with the fall of the Soviets, or with uh, the invasion of Ukraine, or some other event, or, or the arrival of the Wuhan flu. We don't know what future historians will say ends the uh, contemporary period. But we know that World War I starts it. World War I affects everything in Europe, the Middle East, the former colonies and current colonies of Europe, and those countries not under direct European dominion. In other words, everywhere. Ultimately, the world of the Siriono of uh, the Amazon rainforest, uh, an old Stone Age tribe that lives in the Amazon jungles, is going to be affected by modern man. Ultimately, the uh, worshippers of the cargo cult in the high mountains of of Papua New Guinea are going to be affected by the arrival of modern man in their world. Everything, everywhere, without exception, period, is changed by World War I. Israel is created by World War I. Communism takes over Russia because of World War I. The National Socialists and Fascists take over uh, Germany and Italy because of World War I. The Great Depression happens because of World War I. America stepping up and displacing Britain happens as a result of World War I. Ultimately, the colonial empires are undermined by the United States and opposed by the Soviet Union as an indirect result of World War I. Atomic weapons are developed as a result of World War I. They were female emancipation as a result of World War I, and a bunch of other things, uh, including everything. Uh, rarely will a historian say uh, something in terms of totalities, but I am not exaggerating. I am not being hyperbolic. I am not overestimating. World War I is the fulcrum of the modern world. World War II is an offshoot. The Cold War is an offshoot. The wars in the Middle East are an offshoot. The... Communization of China is an offshoot, everything a result of World War I. So, let's study it. Uh, if you look in your notes, because I haven't had time to put them on the board, because if I had, I would have realized, gee, I have to print your notes. We've already covered the Edwardian era. Well, we have covered the German Colossus, Kaiser Wilhelm's personality, which his insistence on provoking conflict with other people, other nations, in order to build his empire and build up a battle fleet, the two alliance system, the uh, Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente, Triple Alliance, Germany, uh, Austria, Italy, the Triple Entente, France, Russia, Britain, the um, imperative to attack, the Schlieffen Plan, the... Um, the ideas of Pan-Slavism, which unify the Russian Empire and the Serbs, who assassinate the heir to the Austrian throne, morons, and um, the miscalculations that come from this, the, the misunderstanding in many circles that mobilization is something that you can take back when it isn't. People think that mobilization is like pulling the hammer back on a revolver. It is not necessarily going to fire unless you tap the trigger or drop the weapon or tap the hammer. Unless you do something careless or stupid or purposeful, the weapon will not fire. But it's not. It's a single action. Draw, pull, shoot. And they don't understand this. So when people order their countries to mobilize as a threat display, it leads directly to war. The mobilization is into enemy territory. 
And the fact that the Germans, again, the Germans didn't need to build a fleet, but they did, which antagonizes the British, bringing the British into the French and Russian alliance. Had the Germans used their superior military power and attacked directly into France, the British were this close not to sending troops. They would have supported the alliance with naval power the way the British Empire always does. But because Belgium is raped, because Belgian neutrality is violated, and because the Germans do not think that the British will go to war over, quote, a scrap of paper, the Germans miscalculate and invade Belgium to get some kind of tactical advantage. But what it does is it brings the British fully into the war, and they land an army of, I think, six divisions. It's small by European standards, but each of these divisions is composed of crack riflemen, the best man-for-man -man soldiers on earth, better than the Germans. Man-for-man -man are the British in this time. And it's the British army, as well as the French, that uh, is going to do what happens at the Schlieffen plan. Now, there's a wonderful book about this called The Guns of August by a historian named Barbara Tuckman. It was published around 1960. And this is a historian who's writing about an event that at that time, most people personally knew about. In 1960, there were a lot of people who were alive during World War I still around. And yet, She's a good enough writer to make it a page turn, wondering what's going to happen next. A really good historian can do that, can make a historical event that happened years, decades, centuries ago seem exciting because you wonder what's going to happen next. It's not that hard to find out. But here, here's how things start. The guns of August, because the uh, war happens August 1st and then August 3rd, um, 1914. So, the Germans mobilize into Belgium, according to the Schlieffen plan. The British warn the Germans off, the Germans ignore them. And by this point, the Germans are actually past Belgium, and they're entering into northeastern France. The British land their troops and block, set themselves up in a blocking position near the coast, near the city of Ypres among other places. The German steamroller is just coming in, or the German arc of advance. But there's a problem. The Russians surprise everyone by being much more efficient. See, after the Russo-Japanese War, everyone developed a contempt for the Russian military because they did so poorly against the Japanese. But Russia is like Janus. There are times when it is completely incompetent in war, and there are other times when it's completely competent. And you never can tell which Russia you're dealing with. Right now, the fact that they haven't conquered Ukraine yet is an indication that the Russian army at the present moment is either not fighting to its full capacity or is in one of its down phases. It happens. It's, 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 it's part of the national character. It comes, it's like the tide. It's in or out. But in 1914... Two Russian armies invade East Prussia within a week uh, or so of the declaration of war. No one expected this. And a lot of the aristos who rule Germany have territory, have land in East Prussia. So a lot of noblemen begin crying, our estates are at risk, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. And uh, the general staff begins getting political pressure. Now, the general staff is run by the grandnephew of General von Moltke, who was the great victor of the Franco-Prussian War. But the later Moltke is no genius. The later Moltke has already altered the Schlieffen plan by strengthening the East more than Schlieffen wanted and avoiding the invasion of Holland. But he still has most of Germany's attack forces going through Belgium into northern France. But now, there's panic. Because the Russians are not only moving in, they actually win a battle at the frontiers. So the German guard force in the east is retreating very rapidly ahead of the Russians. And there's panic. Because no one expected this. So... The general staff orders an entire army corps, that's several armies, 
off of the attack against France, and it start, this army corps starts crossing Germany to become of use in, you know, if, uh, against the Russians. All of this have effects. Because Germany's attack, and I'm just going to draw it as it arrives in France, has a bunch of armies coming out of Belgium, but there's only one army now that is going to go to the left of Paris. Originally, Schlieffen's plan was to have the bulk of the German army north and west of Paris, where nobody expected to fight, which would give the Germans an advantage. But because of the British slowing them down and because of the loss of this corps, the Germans are attacking farther east and more quickly south than anyone expected. Only the first German army under a general named von Kluck is, is scheduled to go west of Paris. Meanwhile, before the Corps gets to the east, a new duo is put in command on the eastern front. An old general comes out of retirement, General von Hindenburg, and he's going to be an important figure for the next 20 years in German politics and the German military. But von Hindenburg is a symbol. He's got common sense, he's got a good voice, everyone respects him, he's like Washington. But like Washington, Hindenburg is not a military genius. But Hindenburg does have a guy who is a military genius working for him. Hindenburg's aide is an assistant named Eric Ludendorff. Not a Vaughn, just a German commoner who's really freaking smart. He's a general staff officer. So what Hindenburg promises in general terms, Ludendorff delivers in terms of the details. And these two are going to end up running Germany before the end of the war. The Kaiser is going to be assembled. It's going to be Hindenburg and Ludendorff. So they go east, they organize things, and at the Battle of Tannenburg, the two Russian armies are hit one at a time. The Germans concentrate their forces, and by hitting the Russians one at a time, rather than simultaneously, the Germans overwhelm each Russian army. It doesn't help that the Russians are communicating by radio without code in the clear, because radio is so new to the Russian army that the Russians actually assume nobody can pick up their signals. So the Germans, who have guys that can speak good Russian, are listening to the Russian army make its plans and direct its troops by radio. The Russians quickly learn to do things in code. Um, but the Germans win the Battle of Tannenburg and, and a subsequent battle. Uh, and push the Russians back. All before the army corps that was sent to relieve East Prussia arrives. That army corps, had it been on the Western Front, might have made all the difference, but it isn't. As the Germans are moving through Belgium, they come to the Mons Canal. Belgium has a lot of canals. And as they're approaching it, they begin taking what they consider to be heavy machine gun fire from a ridiculous number of machine guns in a closed space. The entire German approach to war, uh, 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 approach to squad tactics, which is the tactics you use for 50-man units, fewer than 50 men, is built around the machine gun. The infantry is to support the machine gun. The machine gun is the main weapon. So the fact that there seem to be a bunch of machine guns stymies the German advance because they can't move their own machine guns up quickly. But it's not machine guns. It's the British Expeditionary Force. It's the BEF, the British Army. The British Army have practiced for generations what's called, well, actually for a generation since they got better weapons, what's called the Mad Minute. And their weapon, the short magazine Lee Enfield, is perfect for this. It's a bolt-action rifle with a very, very quick turnaround. So what the British practice is one solid minute of rapid-fire aimed rifle fire. The key there is aimed. They're not just spraying and praying. Each shot is at a particular target. And Lee Enfield is a very good weapon. So what the Germans think are a bunch of machine guns is actually just plain British infantry doing something the Germans themselves can't do. Oh, that, that upsets the Germans very much. <laughs> they like to think of themselves as the best as it war ever. Um, so the Germans are slowed down, their attack is coming farther south and east than it should, 
And it looks like Paris might, well, we're unsure. Maybe Paris will survive, maybe it won't. So at this moment, an old Frenchman named Galliani is put in charge of Paris, and he orders the taxis of Paris, everyone with a vehicle, particularly the taxis, to ship all of the Parisian military reserves right to the front by car. This is the first time that motor vehicles, not trains, are going to be used to put troops in the way. And at the first Battle of the Marne, a three-day battle, the French and British hold the line northeast of Paris. The Germans try and try and try and fail to break through. Had the Germans won this battle, it's very likely the war would have been a quick one. But it wasn't. Because the French and British win the Battle of the Marne, uh, the war is going to go on. And at this point, what happens is that each side is trying to race each other to the sea. So you have attacks northward and northward and northward. And I'm getting confused now. Northward. And it's in this last attack, an attack by the Germans against the Belgian town of Ypres, which is spelled Y-P-R-E-S. I always, when I was a kid, thought it was pronounced Wipers, but it's not. It's Ypres. Um, and what is set up is the first battle that Adolf Hitler is involved in. He's one of the German uh, infantrymen being marched towards the, um, the city of uh, Ypres. So what we end up with after the rush to the sea is the Western Front, which is going to become a static fixture for the next three and a half years. The Germans have Belgium and Holland as neutral. The Germans have all of Belgium except the city of Ypres. And they have a good chunk of northeastern France. They have Luxembourg. And uh, the French have a little area of German territory near Malouz. On the Western Front, the mobility phase ends before Christmas 1914. Both sides begin to dig in. Why? Because the best thing to stop a bullet is earth. Earth stops a bullet better than stone. Stone fractures and splinters all over the place. If you hit a stone fortification with artillery, the rock itself becomes a weapon against the defending soldiers. But if you have earthenwork fortifications, sandbags and trenches, uh, in reality what happens is the artillery kills with its blast and with its shrapnel, but in the end, uh, the earth just goes pfft. If you're underground and you're in a tunnel and it collapses, you're probably dead. But the earth does not become itself a weapon. So both sides begin to dig these long trenches, and soon you have solid trench lines paralleling one another from the Swiss border all the way up to the North Sea. Every so often you've got mortars, you've got machine guns, you've got barbed wire, landmines, and the whole panoply of what will become classic World War I combat is going to be um, uh, done. Let me think. I do have time for one other thing. And this is how want of a battleship causes an entire region of the world to go kablooey. The Turks were somewhat pro-German. The Germans were building a Baghdad to Berlin railway. It was a big deal, big for the Ottoman economy. But the British had been involved in supporting the Ottoman Turks, too. In fact, the Ottomans are, uh, ordered a couple of dreadnought battleships from the British. When the war starts, Winston Churchill is the head of the British Navy. He's the first sea lord, political leader of the Navy. And he makes a decision. Every foreign ship being built in British yards, ships for Chile, for Argentina, and for Turkey, are going to be confiscated by the British for the duration of the war because we need to really outnumber the German high seas fleet. Without those ships, the Germans are closer to us in numbers. They might actually win a battle. So we're going to, we're going to seize all those ships. The Chileans and the Argentines are fine. The Turks are apoplectic, and if you've ever seen an angry Turkish man, that's nothing to sneeze at. These guys are good at anger. The Turks go bug nuts. How dare you? 
Well, the Germans have an answer to this. Seine Majestas Schief, Gerben, a modern German battle cruiser, and a light cruiser named the Gerben, are in the uh, Adriatic Sea. Just before the war, they get out of the Adriatic Sea because it's basically a cul-de-sac, a trap. The entire British and French navies in the Mediterranean Sea, for the next two weeks, try to capture the, or, or destroy the Gerben and Breslau. They first go west, mm -hmm. so that all the formations go west, and then they sneak back east. <laughs> and the British don't realize it until the Gerben and Breslau, these German ships, are approaching the Adriatic. And by that point, it's a chase. And Gerben and Breslau are both fast. A battle cruiser has less armor, but much more speed. The Gerben and Breslau manage to, in a running gunfight, evade the British and French and fight their way to the Dardanelles, this narrow strait of water between the Aegean Sea and the Black Sea. They steam into Constantinople's harbor, pull down the German imperial battle ensign, their eagle, and pull up the Ottoman Turkish flag. The Kaiser has gifted this modern battle cruiser and its light cruiser companion and the crews on those ships to the Ottoman Sultan and to the Turkish government. The Turks declare for Germany and they're at war on Germany's side. And with the Turks come the entire Middle East. This is the basis of the Arab national uprising and the establishment of the State of Israel, which is the cause of so many problems today. One little battleship. That's all it took. Now, I understand why the British seized the battleships, and I, I, I think it's the right call. I think the Turks were actually looking for an excuse to side with Germany anyway. But the battleship chicanery gave them the excuse, and so now it's not... Okay. It's Germany and Austria and, and the Ottoman Empire. What about Italy? They're part of the Triple Alliance. The Italians say, eh, we're not doing it. We're going to follow a policy of what is called Sacre Egoism. Sacre egoisme is divine selfishness, divine egotism. In other words, we're going to hang around, and if the war continues, we're going to let both sides bid for our services. Because we want stuff. So Italy breaks with the other two, and ultimately Italy, since it really wants Austrian territory, is going to side with the Allies. We'll see how good that is in the future. So, that's the opening phase of World War I. The Guns of August, the Battle of the First Battle of the Marne, the Race to the Sea, and the Gerben and Breslau, and uh, Ottoman Turkey is in on the side of the Kaiser. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? And thank you for your attention. Enjoy your weekend. You've got Chapter Survey 27. You've only got uh, three of these left, 27, 28, 29. So we're getting close to the end of that entire slog. Uh, and then you get the case study. So, uh, really no questions? Okay. Thank you for your attention.